I mean, we're always looking for things that are in trouble, right? Um, and so when opportunities come up, we're, we're looking and we're ready to take them down. All right, guys, welcome again to another great episode. Today, we have Jerome Myers. Um, he buys and fixes broken environments, business, and helps people exit that matrix, get that red pill, and see the see the light, essentially. Uh, he's also a corporate dropout. Uh, so the man has his own business, doing really well. Uh, we'll drive in, uh, dive into syndication and JV and his strategies. Uh, and if you're listening, you love the podcast so far, go ahead and leave us a five-star review uh, or any feedback that you want. We appreciate anything. We always want to make ourselves better. Uh, and Jerome, over to you, man. So how did you, uh, how did you go from corporate to uh, a businessman in real estate? How'd you do that, brother? Man, you know, when I went in, I knew I always wanted to be out. I just didn't know how to do it. I'd spent a ton of time getting education and some formal training so I was trying to make the best of it. And so I got identified as a high potential early on, uh, formally trained as a civil engineer, got on a leadership track in corporate America. And then, you know, things started happening kind of crazy in 2009. I had a couple of mentors, their positions got eliminated and my career kind of came to a halt. I was on this like rocket ship trajectory. And then I was just stuck in this job I really didn't like for about 30 months. Uh, fast forward, a um, few jobs later, I was in a position, I was num employee number two in a division for a construction company. Um, I showed up uh, on January 13th. By about August 15th, we went to 175 employees. And by the end of the year, uh, we built a client about $20 million. And so, you know, I built a really big business before walking out the door, and I didn't have a whole lot of oversight. I remember specifically speaking at a conference on behalf of the company and a lady saying, I'm really proud of you. I'm glad to see somebody like you owning a business is doing so well. And it struck me because she thought that I was running a company that was doing a ton of revenue. I think that was a like Fortune 550 company that I was working for. And so, you know, that really was confirmation for me. And so the reward I got for building that big business and creating all that revenue was laying off people. So at the end of that first year, I remember talking to my supervisor on Christmas Eve and him telling me, hey, look, you can pick who's gonna get laid off or somebody else can do it, but I recommend that you do it because you've got to rebuild the team and go forward into the next year. And so, you know, I spent the holidays figuring that stuff out. Fast forward to Thanksgiving of the next year, and we're doing the same thing. And when I walked back in in January, I was like, I'm never doing this again. This sucks. I, I don't ever want to be part of this type of transition. Um, we got to November and I said, I'm out. I, I pulled the rip cord and I jumped out of corporate America, decided I was going to build on my own. And so what I've been doing on the side along the way was lending money to flicks and flip investors. And so I was learning that business as a hard money lender. And, you know, I, I thought the worst case scenario, I could just go fix and flip houses. Um, so, you know, I, I decided to leave and I walked out and I went back to this experience I had in college when I was a sophomore. My friend Duran and I were sitting on a stoop and we were doing the math. I paid three ninety five. He pays three ninety five two roommates. And, you know, that was twelve hundred dollars a unit. Right. You multiply that across a complex. This guy was making seven hundred thousand dollars a year top line. We'd never seen him. We didn't talk to him and we didn't even know how to get in touch with him if we wanted to. It's like, this is brilliant. He figured out how to decouple his time for money. And so I knew that I wanted to do that, but I just didn't know how. Um, so I jumped on LoopNet, started looking for buildings and I was like, oh, I got one. I took it to a bank. They were like, yeah, no. I was like, what do you mean? I got a uh, MBA. I got a project management professional certification. I'm a licensed engineer. Like what, why, yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Right. And I just kept going down the list of accolades. I just built a $20 million business that was 30% profitable. What do you mean you don't want to lend to me? And it was like, yeah, you don't have experience. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? This little building? What and so anyway, I did that 10 times, guys. And nobody would lend to me. I had to get experience. And so I went and packed my bags and started fixing and flipping houses because that's what I felt like I could do. And I could get money to do that. Uh, so I did that. And fortunately for me, uh, 
I was sitting on the stoop one day. The stoop is a magical place for me. The guy pulls up and he's like, hey, <laughs> we're getting ready to do a house down the street. Why don't you let me look through your properties so we can figure out what we need to do on ours? I was like, sure, go ahead, man. And we're walking around, he's touring my property. And he's like, yeah, I'm getting ready to put an offer in on this building in Church Hill. I was like, man, I tried to buy that thing uh, four or five months ago, but I didn't try experience, so I couldn't get any money to do it. He said, yeah, well, I'm gonna make an offer today. I was like, please don't leave me out, let me in the deal. He's like, what are you gonna bring? How much money you got? I was like, we'll figure that part out. Just don't leave me out. He made the offer, left me out, right? And fortunately, it didn't get accepted. So. He goes and talks to one of the guys I was lending money to. He's like, oh, yeah, that's the one Jerome was talking about. I'm not doing a deal unless he does it. And so I get back in the game, right? So it's the three of us. <laughs> we add in a property manager and then the broker that brought the guy the deal. And we're, it's a band of five of us. And so we take down this 23 unit, um, too, not too far from where I was flipping houses. And that's how I got into the game, man. That's, man, that's awesome. awesome. Okay. So let me, let me ask you, what you, so you obviously, your first deal then, it was with a partnership. And yep. it was with a partner that basically was trying to kick you to the curb. And yep. you came back to that person and you did business with that person. Can you, I mean, why? Like, why do you stick to that one? I didn't have a choice. He was the only person that I knew that had multifamily experience, right? And yeah. the fact of the matter is like, you know, I appreciate you guys. I'm the son of a soldier, right? My dad was a listed man. He wasn't an officer. We didn't have any doctors, attorneys, or lawyers coming over, or uh, dentists coming over to our house for dinner. No businessmen were coming to hang out with us. You know, he'd go to work. He worked the Carolina half day. He's there for PT. He might come home to shower. Then he's back in the office all day. He'll get home at six. That's the life of a, you know, he was a non-commissioned officer when he, at the end of his career. But, you know, he was gone from six to six. It was just part of it. And, you know, they weren't coming to us to talk about investing. They weren't, none of that. Yeah. But yeah. We, you know, that just wasn't my network. I went to state schools. Yeah, I, I was an engineer, but all of my peers, most of them were first generation college graduates, right? So, you know, you talk about building wealth and all this other stuff. I just didn't have exposure to people that could go get a million dollar loan, which is what that one was. And so, you know, he was the conduit to get through it. Nice. Oh man, that's your, did you have any, did he have any reservation? Did you guys have any conflict once, once you actually got into the deal? I mean, I think once, once you're in it, then it becomes a more of a, Hey, let's make it happen kind of thing. Did he have, we had plenty of conflict, right? <clears throat> <laughs> this is my deal. Like, I mean, I could go through all the things. The first one was, Hey, it's time to close. When is Jerome going to put his money in? Hey guys, we don't have a signed asset management contract. We don't have a signed uh, general contractor contract. We don't have a signed project manager or a property manager contract. I don't want to close the deal until we have those things in place. All right, well, if you're not going to put your money in, then somebody else will just put the money in for you and then we'll just leave you out the deal. Like, I mean, it was just stuff along the way where, you know, I wanted things to have certain order and everybody wasn't on board with that. And that's okay. But, you know, you really got to know who you're partnering with. And on the backside of that, like, if your values aren't aligned, if you don't see the world from a similar perspective, then you set yourself up for failure. Because, you know, the majority of stuff that we buy is from failed partnerships at this point, because they sell things at a discount. Um, somebody wants to get out, they have a liquidity event, and they need to get cash. Um, the partners can't get a, agree on business plan or strategy and they want to liquidate and we come in and, and we help people with those problems because the, typically if the partnership isn't working, the business won't work either. Absolutely. That's good, man. So you went, so you found your, your first strategy, JV, right? And then from there, have you done capital raise and syndication as well, or is this all just JV? All we do is JV. Uh, we like that model. Um, it's a little bit slower than what a lot of people are doing with syndication, but we like to be able to have that flexibility and we, we've got a different approach, right? We want to make an impact on the community as well as make money, right? And so let's say there's something going on in the property and we want to make a decision that isn't going to be best for profitability. I can call my three or four partners on the deal and say, Hey, here's what's happening. We can do this or we can do that. What do you guys want to do? 
with a syndication, that same thing can happen, but those limited partners are probably a whole lot more interested in getting their monthly distribution than having a quick phone call and making a decision on what happens next. Um, and so, you know, we like that idea. The other thing that we really like about the joint venture model is we got the ability to bring people into the game, right? Uh, whether you like it or not, multifamily, where you got traditional financing, is a, a fraternity or sorority. One of the brothers or the sisters got to bring you into the game because if they don't, yeah. you don't have that experience partner criteria checked off, right? And so, just like I couldn't get into the space and didn't know how to get into the space, now we're creating a platform where, you know, if somebody's uh, ready to move into that space, we can help them do that because, you know, we've got people who've done deals, we've got balance sheet, we've got all these different things set up. And so when people come through our coaching program or, you know, go through our courses, we can help them make that transition and actually get a deal done. Um, one of the things that we've struggled with a lot is, we talk to people who've been through the more expensive guru programs, you know, $25,000, $50,000, and they still don't get a deal done. And yeah. liken it to like fishing, right? You, if anybody's uh, heard the story about Moby Dick, you got Captain Ahab trying to take down Moby Dick. And that's what I think a person who's only bought a single family home or never bought a property before going to try to take down a $10 million property looks like, right? It's just kind of crazy that you're going to go get a loan that big. Um, what I think is a lot more feasible as a strategy is to take down something 500, 750,000 up to maybe 1.5 million with some other people, learn how to operate in that space. And then you got that experience to take and go do another deal. Um, you know, people talk about, hey, put your money in my deal as an LP and you'll get the experience. No, you're going to get reports, right? That, that doesn't get you experience with the bank. It doesn't those things don't actually work. And so we want people to actually be operators and be part of the JV structure. Or, you know, it, it's no different than a general partnership. Yeah. Syndications and JVs are the same thing, except there is no LP in the JV structure. So, you know, you want to be in a general partnership in both. Wow, man. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. So how, so how do you find your partners? Or are they already solidified now? If you're already have your set partners and that's it. No, we do, we do new partnerships for every deal, right? We buy by, we put partnerships together by the building. So, you know, we, we created a community called Myers Methods and the goal there is to put people together. Some people have money, some people have balance sheets, some people have experience, some people have deals, some people don't really have much at all, right? But you got the opportunity to learn and then create these mutually beneficial relationships. But the first thing that we wanted to create was where people could actually meet other people who were actually doing the business. Cause you know, I just didn't know how to do that when I was trying to get into the space. I hear you, man. And then that's all your stuff, man. So how, where, where are you at now with Myers methods as far as the community and your business and how many units uh, and, and where do you plan on going with that? Yeah, so we're on a mission to buy a thousand doors, man. Um, where are we? We have bought 90 um, spread across uh, Greensboro, North Carolina and Richmond, Virginia. We are pretty selective about the markets and the properties that we buy. Uh, looking to, we usually buy things that we can either grow rents by 100 or 150 bucks after a renovation, or we can decrease expenses by something similar to that. Because for us, it's all about a forced appreciation play, right? We, we want to drive the net operating income with the goal to refinance, return all the principal that was invested originally, and then either um, keep that thing and let it keep flowing for us and play with house money or sell it to somebody who wants the property a lot more than what we do. Awesome, man. And then when you're, when you're looking at uh, your, you know, you say better the the community what are you doing for the community itself uh what, what projects you have what kind of initiatives have you started i really like that that point of view and that it's not just about money so what do you got going on there man yeah i mean for us it's just what is the property in the community need right it might not be like a program where we're giving out computers you know ryan norris and uh, ian tudor talk about scholarships and some of the other cool things that they're doing in their mobile home communities. It's really just being able to have the flexibility in a given month. Like for instance, a lot of people are trying to figure out what to do with COVID. So if somebody had an issue, 
maybe they didn't have money for groceries or something else, we may be able to step in and help with that or make the referral to the right place and potentially, you know, maybe we made a donation to that to try to make the people intersect so that we become kind of like that surrogate or, you know, that place where people are getting handouts instead of them, you know, treating uh, the relationship that we have as the business that it is. Awesome, man. Jeremy, what you got? No, I mean, going back to, uh, because I'm, I'm pretty interested on the, uh, on the uh, on the partnership, right? You do things a little different. Uh, bless you. Uh, you do you do things a little different than than, than most people that we talk to. Um, looking back, if you would have what you know now, would you go to a partnership the same way that you did on your first deal? Probably because it was my way into the door, right? Okay, it wasn't ideal. Right. And I encourage people not to get into partnerships with people they don't know because of that. You know, the fact of the matter is, you know, I was even though I, I thought I was doing pretty well financially, I of the five people, I was in the middle range of as far as assets and cash available. There were a couple of guys who were just, you know, far my senior and, you know, they were in more much more seasoned. Right. They've been investing in real estate yeah. for a long time. Um, they had corporate careers and, and, you know, they made a lot of money. And so in that project, like I wanted to do it by myself, but had I done that project by myself, I would have bankrupted myself. Right. Okay. Because I was in that deal with the right guys, they were able to swoop in and save and write checks and put additional, we had to do a capital call. They were able to put additional capital in, in order for us to get through the rehab. Um, and, you know, on the backside of that, you know, we bought that property where rents were six ninety five. Today we run them for eleven ninety five, but you know it was nice. really rough getting through that, right? And yeah, we we thought that the budget was going to be what the budget was, and it wasn't. I mean, just to put things in perspective, like for anybody who fix and flips, you know you're going to be off in some way, shape, or form. Well, if you're off by two thousand dollars on your rehab budget and you're doing twenty thousand dollar rehab, whoop de doo, not a big deal. If you're off by two thousand dollars on a twenty-five unit building, that's half a million dollars yeah. Yeah. not accounted for, right? You got to be able to write that check in case things go wrong. And a lot of people aren't ready for that. So I was super grateful for you know what the guys could bring to the table, but you know the conflict and some of the struggles that we had early on could have been uh, avoided had we done a more of a better fit or test, yeah. for, you know, compatibility. Yeah. Cool. Well, at least least you got you on the door. So that's good. Yeah. And that, that's so true. Like, you know, as far as, you know, what you don't, what what you don't see coming, right? Because you you get there and you're like, Oh, snap. There's a lot of more things that we actually need. And that's good that you had that. You could do a capital call and all that. That's great stuff, man. So, you know, you have, you have a great business driving community. Um, And then I think you also have a, a, do, do you host a, a speaking engagement a platform mfin yeah. is that what you're yours oh so mfin is dan hanford so i'm, I'm speaking oh. to one um we're doing a conference at the end of july called uh, mid-atlantic multifamily investing that's the one yeah it's going to be here in greensboro and the goal is to have that one live as soon as you know everything opens back up just want to get people together. I think people are going to be excited to get back together. We got caught right on the tail end of March. That's when we were supposed to do it. But um, July 31 through August 2nd is where we're slated to bring about 200 investors together here in Greensboro and go through two and a half days worth of real estate investing, and get some success stories, no pitch whatsoever. I um, mean, just people just hammering down the value and explaining how multifamily can make a difference in not only the lives of the people that invest in it, but the people who reside in those communities. Yeah, I hear that's you. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then, so, you know, with this whole COVID thing, like what, what's the strategy right now? Are you, are you standing by waiting for uh, maybe deals come Q3, Q4? Um, are you prepping? <laughs> Are you actively buying? What, what, yeah, what, what do you got going on there? I mean, we're always looking for things that are in trouble, right? Um, and so when opportunities come up, we're, we're looking and we're ready to take them down. Uh, one of the things that's been tough for us is like a lot of the partners don't know where things are going. And, you know, nobody wants to catch a fallen knife, right? 
Yep. So we're just trying to figure out, okay, where are rent collections going to be? And from there, we're going. But, you know, actively, we're working on 120-unit development here in Greensboro, where we're going ground up on six acres in a part of town that hasn't had a ton of development. Um, and we've got a few other deals that are in the hopper, kind of bouncing back and forth. The thing that's been tough, again, is just partners coming in because I mean those are larger deals one is six million and the other was 20 million and just seeing hey we want to be in the space and we want to write contracts right now or no let's wait a little bit and see if we can get a better deal if somebody's willing to make a discount or find something else where somebody was in distress the thing that I think is probably most uh, telling for inexperienced investors is those guys who are looking for deals right now. You haven't actually had a chance to fill any of the stress, right? Some of the money was collected in April without a doubt. I think nationwide collections yeah. were above 85%. And so if your deal didn't work at 85%, you bought it too skinny anyway, right? And I'm not gonna say people were over leveraged. I'm not gonna say, you know, they aren't running their business well, just saying, hey, look, you know, there are challenges with your business and you need to restructure the way that you structured it. Um, for May, you know, we collected more money in the first five days of May than the first five days of April. And so in doing that, I mean, it's just telling us that the economy looks like it's going to be pretty good. And so we're kicking a can down the road and let's see what happens in June. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, there wasn't a problem with real estate before this thing happened. Like this was a health crisis where we had to take some drastic actions in order to protect the most vulnerable people. And so for us, we don't think that magically the demand for housing has gone away and rental housing in particular. And so it's still going to be there. It's not like we can outsource this and send this to China. Right. And so there may be some consolidation. You may see some people doubling up or tripling up, but that's only temporary. It's only going to last for so long. People are going to think it's a great idea, maybe six months if that, but then they're going to be coming back out. And as the economy opens back up and things get back roaring again, you know, we'll, We'll come back to a really solid place. But, you know, we renewed some leases recently. We bumped their rent. Um, you know, for people who are moving out, we're not giving them to month to month extension. We're letting them go ahead and move out on the day where their lease ends. And, you know, we're just treating it as business as usual. If somebody's been impacted, we're not cold. You know, we just have the conversation. Have you filed for unemployment? Did you file your taxes? Um, and so just to make sure people can get their stimulus money and get those unemployment benefits, because yeah. the fact of the matter is a lot of people will be making more money with unemployment and stimulus than they did having a job. Yeah. That is a fact right there. <laughs> There's a lot of money coming out of government right now, man. That's awesome, man. Um, so you got a lot going on, man, and I commend you for all your success and everything. Uh, I got a, few more questions before we kind of wrap it up but Jeremy what, what do you have so yeah so what type of uh, so everybody has their niche right and, and like I said you you have a different type of business uh, what who is your the, the perfect student for your uh, for, for you guys who, who fits in your programs yeah I mean I think it's somebody who wants to do good in the community but also wants to learn how to make money it's somebody who wants to do a deal that's something less than $2 million because I don't really think those deals really fit for PPM because um, it's pretty expensive to build one. Somebody who has a small group of friends who are interested in doing something like this, um, you know, it's not for somebody who doesn't have any cash. It's for people who would be able to pay for one of those more expensive courses, but instead would rather spend a little bit less on, a lot less on education and then use that money to go find their next deal. Um, and it's, I guess the other piece of it is, is for people who want to buy things that aren't operating really well, right? There's some people who just want to buy turnkey, it's already fixed, they don't have any problems to fix. Um, that's not our model. Our model is to find something that's broken, figure out what that is, um, then we fix it, and then, you know, we get the money back out that we put in so that we go to another deal or we sell the property for what we consider to be a nice profit. And just to clarify, do they need to be uh, accredited investors or just anybody? No, they don't need to be accredited investors. They just need to have cash in hand, right? I mean, you know, if, if somebody's got twenty five, thirty thousand dollars and they're ready to get in the game, I think that's a great place. If somebody's got three thousand dollars, they're not ready to be a multifamily investor. There's just cash demands that 
I don't think you're able to handle when you don't have any money. And it's nothing wrong with not having cash right now. Like some people frown on them. They don't have time for them. I just know that we can help people best who have like some real liquid cash where they can go into a deal and have an interest in getting education. What I've seen more often than not is, hey, I've got this money. I'm going to go buy a deal and make all the mistakes, kind of learn on the job. And I think that is the most inefficient and ineffective way to do it. Because if you're not careful, you're going to bankrupt yourself. Like, and you know, the other piece is the bank isn't going to help you get in trouble. And so you could get in some of this creative stuff where, you know, you can buy owner financed or you can get hard money. And depending on who you're dealing with, they're going to set you up for failure just so they can get the property back and do it all over again. You see it a lot with mobile homes, right? You'll see somebody sell a mobile home to somebody and then they can't make the payments, they foreclose, they put a little bit of paint on the wall, they resell it to somebody else for a big down payment and they just keep doing that perpetual cycle. People do that with real estate too, like the bigger stuff. So there are lenders, bridge debt lenders who will, they loan to own is what they call it. And so they come in, they get you to bring 30, 40% of the money and you hopefully you bought it at a discount. And so now their cost basis is something less than 50%. And they can take that property, either keep it and cash flow it, or they can sell it to somebody at 70% of loan to value and make a really nice profit without doing any other work. And so, you know, people have to be careful because uh, every time that they think they're actually shortcutting the process, um, they end up in trouble. And so I think yeah. four things that, uh, people are trying to work through as investors. The bottom one is knowledge, right? So if you don't have any knowledge, you shouldn't be investing. And I think it is more than just uh, YouTube, you and podcasts. Um, I, d I went that route. It is not the right route. I yeah. ended up many days confused and lost. And I wish I really had somebody curate the content. So I had a continuous logical progression to get me through it. Um, after knowledge, you want to have deal flow. A lot of people think that they have a deal and they have a lead. Same letters, but very different things, guys, right? A lot of people, so you apply that knowledge against the leads to determine whether or not you have a deal. If you have a deal, then you need experience to complete the operations, right? You got to run a whole business plan against that. And then after you have the experience, the money comes. People will tell you, hey, if you got a deal, the money will show up. Maybe a single family because they can get a first position lien on the property. But when you get into these multis, you need some experience so that you can get the bank money as well as investor money to fund the down payment and take that thing down. True. Man, that's all great nuggets right there, man. That is definitely true because there's a lot of people that will loan you the money, <laughs> but they will definitely get everything back from you no matter what, including yeah. the shirt off your back. So yeah, you definitely have to be careful. Do your own due diligence. Make sure financing is right. Uh, and you know, you got to take care of yourself and make sure it happens. Um, a little bit of guidance is always uh, necessary with any of this, man. I appreciate that, man. Um, moving forward, last question we always like to kind of ask. Uh, hot topic that never really gets discussed on real estate uh, podcasts that I don't hear that much. But I get asked a lot. It's like, hey, how do you balance family? How do you balance real estate? You know, I'm, I'm driving 100% towards real estate. My spouse may not be on it. I have kids. I'm also trying to do, uh, make sure they're happy. Um, you know, how, how do you work that? How do you balance it? How do you make it happen? And how do you keep a healthy balance in your life? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in work-life integration. I think everything touches everything else and it's going to impact each stuff. There are going to be times when you want to work and you got to do stuff for family. There's going to be times when you want to do stuff for family and you got to work. Um, for me, I just, I balance it by getting up, right? So I do a lot of stuff while people are asleep. So I'll get up at sometime between four and five o'clock in the morning. And most people at my house aren't up until after six, right? So I got two hours to do the work that I need to get done. And then from there, you know, I got the rest of the day, everybody's off doing their own things. And then in the evenings, like I'm ready to shut it down because I started so early. And so we can get through and work that way. Um, but this is a really hot topic and we've created something to help dads in particular with this. And so we've created a mastermind called the Pow Wow at the Mountaintop. And it's specifically for dads who are in multifamily investing and they're interested in working on themselves and working on their business 
figuring out how to scale it, figuring out how to grow it. And the goal there is just to focus on fathers. Like I think a lot of time men in particular are expected just to go with the flow and get things done. You know, we're taught to be tough. We're taught not to have any feelings. We're taught to just do it and make sure everybody else is taken care of, but never anybody's really looking out for us. And so being able to have those conversations about self uh, care and, um, you know, just becoming the best people that we can absolutely be, because I believe like you got to put your mask on first, right? There's a reason why they say that on the airplane. And if we're completely empty or we don't have anything to breathe, then taking care of everybody else is not going to do any good. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you got to be very transparent about what your goals are and communicate those to the people that are closest to you. And in doing that, you know, you can set some ground rules and boundaries, and then you keep your promises that you make. If you say, hey, honey, and kid, you know, Johnny one and Susie two, we're, we're going to have dinner at six o'clock every night. I'm not going to have my phone or my computer at the dinner table. And we're just going to check in and talk. Like in that schedule and, you know, you, re, phone rings, it doesn't matter. Uh, email goes off, none of that stuff matters. And you just lock in and focus. Or, you know, if it's a Saturday morning and the kids want to watch cartoons and you don't really want to do that, but that's what they want to do. Spending that time with them is irreplaceable. Or, you know, if the wife needs date night, you know, like you've got to plan those things in your personal life, just like you would in your business. And then yeah. be true to those promises. And I think that piece of accountability and letting people be thought of is the difference between the success and not success in that space. Man, that, that mm -hmm. was deep. That was deep. I love it, man. I love the mindset too. Uh, that's something uh, I relate to and I always like to encourage people to do as well. So yeah, awesome stuff, man. Jeremy, you had something? No, I'm good. I'm, everything's good, and, and I appreciate the uh, the time and all the nuggets, and the fact that you give us a different perspective on the uh, on multifamily investing. That's that's awesome. Yeah, man. We thank you so much for coming, brother. And then last thing, <laughs> tell people where they can find you. Yeah. So if you're interested in finding out why we like joint ventures over syndications. Uh, hit MyersMethods.com. We got a free four-step guide and like a 15 or 20-minute talk that explains that in super deep detail. Um, and you, you can grab that off the website. I love connecting on LinkedIn, super active there. I'm Jerome Myers on LinkedIn, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Sweet, man. Awesome. Again, thank you for coming on and we really appreciate all the nuggets, brother. <laughs>